Uh, my name is Maltam Toxus. I'm from the history department here at Brown, uh, um, as well as Middle East studies. I'm very, very happy to uh, have Dilan Okcholu present <clears throat> her research of late years, of the uh, few recent years uh, in Turkey, and on the very subject she's going to talk about today. Um, it's not very surprising uh, to have a speaker and topic um, on this uh, on the borders of Turkey today, as uh, you, you, I'm sure you all know, um, the the, these very borders are changing almost daily these days by the latest Turkish invasion, continuous Turkish invasion into Syria uh, along the uh, Kurdish inhabited areas. Dilan Okçoğlu, Dr. Dilan Okçoğlu, comes to us today from uh, Washington, D.C. at, as it says there, Global Kurdish Studies, American University, which is a second postdoctoral position for her after her post, uh, first postdoc at Cornell University uh, last year. Uh, Dilan is a very fresh PhD in the sense that she finished her PhD in 2019 that uh, used her field work in the Turkish cities of Van and Hakkari, located along the borders of Turkey, but also Iraq, Iran, and uh, Iraq and Iran, um, pre pre predominantly inhabited by, by Kurds. Um, Dilan is on the, in the process of pr uh, preparing uh, her book, tentatively titled Control, Resistance, and Containment on Turkey's Kurdish Borderlands. Um, the, um, the, the book uh, project is expected to be finished in the next uh, year or so. Um, without further ado, I welcome Dilan for this difficult topic. <laughs> Come on. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, I would like to start with thanking the organizers, Professor Melton Toxos and uh, my dear friend, dear uh, Dr. Nazan Bidranoğlu. Uh, so, and also, of course, um, Watson Institute and Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Um, so, today, actually, I will be talking about my uh, research on territorial control and the lived experiences of these control mechanisms. Um, along the Kurdish populated borders of Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. Um, and um, so the research uh, is based on my uh, 12 months of uh, ethnographic fieldwork uh, in this area uh, from the summer of 2013 to the summer of 2014. It was not, of course, my first time in the region. Uh, I traveled there in different times. Um, and also, I'm from Dersim, so I'm not uh, unfamiliar uh, with the dynamics of Turkish-Kurdish uh, relations and politics uh, since, I don't know, since probably my post-size childhood, actually. So uh, the uh, main research question uh, here for today's talk is, uh, is the following one. How the mechanisms of territorial control by the Turkish state shape the lived experiences uh, of the Kurdish people in this contested borderlands? Um, actually, we can, of course, put this question um, in a different way, but, of course, um, uh, quite relevant way, which is that what does uh, Turkey's Kurdish borderlands lay out in terms of control and its lived experiences at the margins, right? So this is a part of, as I said, this is a part of the broader project, um, which I uh, did for my PhD uh, degree. And the main question that I asked in that project was, uh, quite relevant to this one, but a little bit different. So you can take that question as the kind of umbrella question under which I also scrutinized uh, some sub-questions. Uh, but today I want to specifically focus on uh, mechanisms, of, mechanisms of control and, uh, and people's narrations and uh, experiences of, the, of these mechanisms. So, um, 
I actually address this question um, by using two methods. Uh, so in order to study the policies of control, uh, I used institutionalism, including historical and sociological institutionalism, as well as process tracing uh, to uh, understand and explain the evolution of policies. Uh, so it's better to just mention this at the outset that there are two main components of this research. One is policy dimension, the other is narrative dimension, okay? So for the second dimension, uh, I of course use political ethnography. Um, and as I, as I said, it's like uh, one year uh, ethnographic research. So the main finding of this research is that I try to come up with a typology of control. And I will actually show you a table uh, which also tells you what I understand by that. What, what, what is this typology? So what is it about? What are the components uh, or definitive features of this typology, right? So, so what are today's objectives? What are the objectives of today's talk? First, I would like to briefly present this typology. Second, I would like to show you that intense use of control, intense use of territorial control, has negative impact on the relationship between the states, Turkish state, and the Kurds. So in another way, actually, we can also say that that's why I mentioned that broader question at the beginning, um, which was like, why did the Kurdish opening in Turkey? Why did the reform process, minority reform process, that was launched by the ruling AKP, which is Erdogan's party, between 2009 and 2013, why is this policy, or the set of policies, uh, fail to mitigate violence, or to achieve its goal? because the state was ex expecting to have some positive change on the ground, but it didn't happen. So what explains these failures? That's why I argue that the intense use of territorial control uh, has outweighed the expected positive outcomes and impact of these minority uh, reform processes, okay? So the third objective of today's talk is that I would like to present that borders and borderlands also serve as the terrain of contestation and compromise between state sovereignty and multiple actors through their link to property and land. So let me give you a brief historical context um, before I um, share the details of this typology with you and some of the mechanisms that I uh, developed in that typology. So what is this historical context? What happened in the 90s and why is 2000s seem to be a little different, at least in the official discourse? So then, of course, during the Q&A, we can say how far is it different? What are the differences and similarities? Right? Um, so 1990s, actually, in the 1990s, we can say that Turkey's rural Kurdistan, uh, most of the towns and villages in the Kurdish region, became the center of uh, warfare between the state and the PKK. So PKK, Partiya Kalkeran Kurdistan, Kurdistan's Workers' Party, is an armed guerrilla movement which was officially um, established in 1984. And um, this armed uprising uh, started after the 1980 coup, military coup. So most of the Kurdish politicians, Kurdish civilians, intellectuals, they were arrested and they were tortured uh, during that time, not only Kurds, also Turkish leftist progressive groups, but of course, uh, this had like that period had some particularities, unique features for Kurds. We can also come back to that uh, during the Q and A. So, what happened in the Arabakur prison? Uh, what does it signify? Was it important to understand the emergence of uh, PKK 
in the history of Turkey and Kurdistan? So these are some of the questions that I can also, I would like to talk. Um, but as I said, for this talk, for now, it's important to remember that 1990s um, were the time when uh, the state um, used excessive, used counterinsurgency strategies excessively. And what are these counterinsurgency strategies that were used against Kurds um, during that time? Of course, here we are talking about the direct use of violence, but also this can also include some indirect forms that we can just, I can just give you some examples. Here, the direct use of violence was the primarily the result of these counterinsurgency strategies led by the Turkish security forces and paramilitary groups. And these strategies actually included military occupation, enforced disappearances, abandonment of villages, forced displacement, which also refers to the strategy of depopulation, curfews, some of you are quite familiar if you know what happened in Jizre in 2016. Um, not only in Jizre, also Slopin, Nusaybin, um, uh, uh, Silvan, Farkin, and others. So curfews, extrajudicial killings, as well as collusion with some right-wing groups, some of whom were also used as paramilitaries against civilians, intellectuals, journalists. So in addition to these harsh violence instruments, uh, we also speak about the use of indirect methods, right? Some of which are the state-sponsored spying system, this also refers to a uh, village guard uh, system. Um, these are uh, the co-opted Kurds uh, who are hired by the state uh, in their fight against the PKK. Um, so these subtle forms also include stigmatization, humiliation, isolation, as well as cooptation, as I said. So even if uh, both sides uh, develop their capacities for warfare over the course of years, the cost of enduring uh, fight war was too high. For instance, PKK announced four ceasefires throughout the 1990s. 1993, 1995, 96, 1998, right before the leader of PKK Ocalan was arrested in 1999, and that year as well. And it was a kind of public announcement which was uh, in national news for some time. However, none of these ended with a durable peace. And meanwhile, the long-term consequences actually had become too much for the state as well. So when we look at those years, what we see is that the cost becomes unbearable for both sides. So the domestic, but also international dynamics um, were prone to launching some change. Some of you, of course, or most of us in literature, we, might also, we may also call that democratic change. The pressure comes from outside, but also from inside. So minority reform process led by Turkey's ruling AKP, I think was initiated um, in that kind of context. Because there are some arguments in literature saying that um, the motivation for AKP to launch these minority reforms was mostly because of their willingness to be part of EU. The pressure came from outside. Um, well, actually, I challenge that argument, and I also say that uh, pressure was coming from inside as well. So then, uh, again, uh, the relevant question, the important question here is then, so what is that pressure that's coming from inside, right? So I think my answer, uh, which looks at control mechanisms and their impact on the ground, uh, also speaks to that question. 
So after AKP came to power in 2002, we can talk about, we can roughly talk about a three-stage process. Of course, there are uh, some critical moments uh, affecting the relationship between the state and PKK, uh, which has profound impact on the ground, on the lives of, on the everyday lives of people uh, living in these contested areas. Uh, but for me, the, the important, the most important period was 2009 and 2013, and of course, the following two years, we, during which PKK and the state both were. Um, both were like both were uh, actually committed to uh, to uh, the ongoing peace talks. That's why there was a ceasefire, and I conducted my field work during that time. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't think that I would I would be able to travel uh, in most of those villages and towns because I was uh, traveling in Van, which is a city right beside. Uh, Turkish-Iranian borders, and then this is the first half uh, of my fieldwork, and then the second half I moved to Hakkari, which is a border city uh, beside uh, Turkey, uh, Iraq, and Iran. It's surrounded by these three nation states where Kurds uh, uh, are populated, and most of them are also living in the borders, so both sides of the borders are populated by Kurds, and some of these Kurds are quite politicized. Um, and uh, that city and the surrounding area is also um, uh, actually uh, very political because they support uh, Kurdish pro Kurdish party HDP, which is known as HDP now, or Democratic Regions Party uh, DBP. Um, and um, PKK can recruit many fighters from those areas, uh, and those borders are also uh, porous, so uh, PKK guerrillas can easily infiltrate uh, through the borders uh, from one side to the other. Um, and also, likewise, Turkish army uh, can launch many cross-border operations uh, in the same uh, area, especially for those who know the history. Uh, you can tell that they are doing that um, um, since the 80s. So, um, Then, actually, if this is the case, if this is the background, what do I argue here, right? As I said, the findings are pretty clear, the typology of territorial control. And I will explain that uh, in this next slide. Um, and I will primarily focus on the first three rows. Uh, but before that, I just want to clarify. Even if I mentioned the question a couple times, I just want to clarify my argument. As I said in the first slide, that the intensive use of territorial control um, negated the expected positive outcome of uh, the so-called Kurdish process, or Kurdish opening, or democratic initiatives, whatever you call it. Then, actually, I would like to call that dual strategy that is pursued by the state. Okay, so here we see that on the one hand, states continues their negotiation with the PKK, but on the other hand, they pursue a different approach and they continue their extensive use of territorial control on the ground. And I make a distinction between macro level po of politics uh, and micro level of politics. Uh, so here, we can say that my explanation uh, works at two distinct levels. So at the state level, as you can see from the slide, I examine democratic reforms, minority reforms, and detail, at the same time, detail various mechanisms of territorial control. This is the state side, right? So what is the Kurdish response then? Like, what happens at the Kurdish level? Here, at that level, I don't want to look at the responses of political actors, because that was the main motivation from the beginning, right? That's why I shared my objectives with you. I also want to see what's happening on the everyday lives of people. 
in these contested areas. People negotiate at the center. They decide design policies in Ankara, which is capital city. But uh, how far does that go? Hmm? So that is uh, the question that I had at the back of my mind from the beginning. Um, because in, even in universities, we're quite privileged. We come together, we talk about politics, and we read. We sometimes have exchange about many things. But uh, what is the impact on these people's lives? So here, uh, you see a couple different arrows, like ho horizontal arrows and vertical arrows. Uh, the vertical arrows here, actually, they show the interaction between the state, Turkish state, and Kurdish actors. Uh, it's also important to mention here in this slide that my research, for my research, I interviewed 115 people uh, because I say Kurdish actors, but who are these actors, right? So uh, the breakdown is like that. 74 of these interviews were with Kurdish civilians, like farmers and villagers, most of whom are IDPs, internal, internal displaced people. And some of these people lost their properties more than once because their hometowns were evacuated and burned at least two times, at least twice. Uh, this was a very common, very widespread practice, especially in the city, of, in the city called Hakkari. And when I was in Hakkari, uh, during the second half of my field work, uh, I also prefer to move to Chukurja. In Kurdish, it's known Chele. I moved to Chukurja and I lived in that uh, zero level border town for two months. Towards the end, yes, I had to leave. I was forced to leave uh, the town and uh, I was directly told by the Turkish police that I stayed too long. Uh, you stayed more than 45 days, right? I was like, probably, yes. Uh, so then I lived in the next, like, eight days, something like that. Um, so um, it's important to remember that a majority of these interviews, the participants were, uh, as I said, villagers and farmers uh, who lost their property and land. Um, this also includes those who lost their access to their land. Uh, because in some cases, uh, their hometowns were not, were not bur burned uh, down, but uh, they lost access to property. That's why, uh, because these people are dependent on agriculture. When you lose your land, when you lose the, your hometown, uh, you, also, it, it, you also lose your future somehow. That's why they had to move to cities, they had to move to uh, centers of towns like, or villages, something like that. So. Um, that's why um, you will see in the chart, you will see in the table when I explain those mechanisms. Um, so, as I said, um, at the, vertical, the, the vertical arrows show the interaction uh, between state and Kurdish actors. At the macro level, the state enacts policies and Kurdish political actors respond. And at the micro level, the state employs, employs these mechanisms, which I identify five of them in this research, and Kurds perceive experience and narrate these mechanisms. And the, the horizontal arrows here show the policies at the state level as well as, well as the responses of Kurds at both levels, both micro and micro. So we can come back to this slide later because I think this slide is uh, one of the backbones uh, of this talk or to understand the details of this research, I think. Um, so, what is uh, this person talking from the beginning? So this is that slide. Um, so here, the typology of control in this contested borderlands. That's the main finding. That is my explanatory factor, or my main explanation also, uh, for the failure of uh, this minority reform process, uh, which is known as Kurdish opening. But also, it goes beyond that, but also, I argue that uh, excessive, intensive use of territorial control on the ground, in these areas especially, um, has negative effects on the relationship between the state and Kurds. Not only, we, we don't, you shouldn't only look at these experiences to understand the failure of reform process, uh, but we should go beyond that picture, right? So when we look at the literature, 
um, in comparative politics, like in border studies, comparative territorial politics, politics of Middle East and North Africa, and of course in Kurdish studies, we see that actually uh, there are many scholars uh, who have been writing on territory, territoriality, um, and some of whom are political geographers, political theorists, um, like Palsy or uh, Stuart Eldon, or some other known theorists like David Miller, who is extensively writing on territorial rights. Um, most of uh, th these discussion, of course, is done in democratic settings, quote unquote. Um, so then the question is, how far can we uh, export these theories? Right? So that was the other challenge when I was working on this topic. Um, it was very, like, everything was very pro-Western. Uh, and uh, some of the scholarship was actually very theoretical. But I was trying to come up with an empirically driven theory. Um, so that I could also go beyond uh, the dominance of state-centric approaches, right? So here, actually, when we look at the theory, we see that this dominant uh, the literature, the existing scholarship, lacks the explanation for the complexity of the relationship between state and mobilized minorities in contested borderlands, okay? So that's why uh, I believe that this research fills that gap in the literature and, uh, in addition to that, contributes to the growing literature on Kurdish studies, border studies, um, as well as comparative territorial studies. So here in this typology, uh, let me introduce that first. I will briefly introduce the categories uh, that mark this typology and then proceed to draw your attention to the sections highlighted. So the first column actually shows us the main motivations of the state uh, for the enactment of these mechanisms. As I said, I identify and explain five of them here. Um, and uh, of course, these five mechanisms correspond or result in certain experiences, as you can see from the third column. Okay, so uh, if you look at the first one, uh, we see that uh, the major mechanism that attempted to establish state sovereignty uh, were expulsion and expropriation. The term expulsion uh, or Forced migration here that I use sometimes interchangeably refers to the deportation of people from their homes and communities so that the place in which they used to reside can be more effectively placed under state control. And the practices of um, expulsion typically occur in, in rural areas where the army sees minorities as a threat to its existence. So in doing so, of course, the state pursues change in the ethnic, ethnic composition uh, of its population in order to reduce the potential risks of cotton cut um, territorial separation. So the process of this uh, expulsion is actually intensified uh, by the lack of fair compensation. This actually, uh, this is one of the common themes that uh, was frequently mentioned uh, by the participants uh, in the interviews. So, some of them said that they couldn't get any money, or some others said they got some money, but lawyers exploited them a lot, so, um, like, uh, Let's say lawyers were supposed to receive 15%, however, they charge 30% uh, of 35, even 35% of uh, the compensation that was paid by the state. So there were different stories, but uh, most of them address that issue uh, um, in different settings or in different words. Uh, so the lack of fair compensation for these people actually result in the loss of resources and rights to their homeland as well. So we also have to remember that uh, many states also claim a right to uh, expropriate property uh, 
for example, to build a highway. That was the other common practice. Or sometimes they built uh, military bases there. Or they, in certain cases, they built schools, and these schools were used as police stations where people were tortured. Um, so that they make a claim that the land was appropriated to serve the public interest. And from the table, as you can see, this expulsion expropriation uh, leads to result in displacement, loss of property and land. So I first just, I would like to define some of these mechanisms because I don't want to uh, jump to the next one or next couple slides and share some real stories with you based on this ethnographic research uh, in this contested borderlands because without definitions, maybe uh, it may be a little difficult uh, to match or to see the connection between mechanisms and um, narratives, right? So that's why I'm just giving you some definitions now at the outset. So here the second mechanism, as I said, for, of course, establishment of state sovereignty is followed by the protection of that sovereignty. Um, so securitization is the other central mechanism of territorial control, uh, largely performed by the army and the police. So what do I mean by securitization here? And interestingly, securitization is experienced as militarization and violence. Even if it's not interesting for some of us, I think it's important to see the gap. Because the other purpose here is to show that the design of policy didn't match with its implementation. That's why I look at two sides, both policy dimension and narrative dimension, right? We have to see the gap between these two. And then, of course, if there are some of you who are interested in policymaking, we can talk about the further implications of that gap. So here, securitization actually refers to excessive militaristic presence and procedures on that territory, including the restrictions of people's freedom by the use of various surveillance mechanisms, ranging from tools of psychological warfare to actual militaristic instruments, such as thermal cameras. Okay. Of course, uh, it's important to remember that this use of securitization is consistent with its use in international relations um, international relations literature. So it refers to a shift from normal politics to emergency politics. Okay? It involves the use of extraordinary measures that break, quote unquote, we will come back to that, I think, somehow, that break the normal political rules of the game. So here, the third one is the control of movement across borders. Okay? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, some scholars prefer to call it border management. You can just uh, say border control. Um, I sometimes use them interchangeably, border control and control of movement across borders. Um, so here, it's important to uh, reiterate the fact that through putting restrictions on the flow of people and goods, both entering and exiting the area, this policy aims, of course, uh, at protecting uh, the state, so protecting the state border, protecting the territorial integrity of state, right? So at present, the land forces command and the gendarmerie general command maintain the security of land borders. So uh, they have different responsibilities, okay, um, but they share it. Um, so, uh, where should we go and, uh, like, who is responsible for the enactment of those policies? That's the answer. So, the last two uh, are, as they are think, I think they are as important as others. Uh, so, there is no, uh, like, any order here in the table. Uh, but given the uh, time constraint and, and, the, and having, like, uh, many uh, interviews, abundance of data, 
I prefer to focus more on the first three uh, for the sake of this, to this talk, but uh, I will be happy to have exchange about the other two mechanisms. I can just briefly mention maybe, as you see from here, uh, right-sizing substate territorial units uh, was also another um, central mechanism of territorial control. This includes both administrative and demographic uh, mechanisms. Um, and uh, these result in violation of uh, rights and uh, disenfranchisement on the part of people. And the last one is, um, I think some of us, are, especially historians, are quite familiar with the last one, I guess, especially those who are working on the history of modern Turkey. Um, so it's, an, it's the uh, nation building one, right? So the state it tries to create a new uh, territory. Um, and uh, some of uh, scho some scholars, maybe Kirill, I guess, he also mentions that it's a Turkification process of geography, something like that, right? Uh, this goes hand in hand with other Turkification policies, including your personal space or something. So uh, the Turkification didn't only include, include uh, remapping geography or nation nationalizing the landscape, but also uh, redesigning uh, both public and uh, personal life. Uh, like like in the, when the Turkish Republic was established, uh, following the collapse of Ottoman Empire. So um, the nationalizing landscape here actually um, results in the denial and loss of cultural heritage and economic practice for people. Uh, so it was enacted through um, multiple policy interventions. Uh, these interventions included the changing of geographic names and the renaming of cities and hamlets, the destruction and replacement of historic sites relevant to cultural reproduction of minorities, as well as inserting of images, flags, and monuments of state holding ethnicity over the landscape. You will see some pictures, uh, uh, like in a few minutes, so it will be <laughs> quite easy to <laughs> imagine what I'm saying. Um, as I said, okay, so this is one of the pictures that I have. I have a couple more following this one. So um, it says, first homeland. So um, there were many of these, uh, but this was just one of them. Uh, and the interesting uh, story behind this one was that it was in the center of Chikurja, Chele. Um, and if you uh, see this slide, which is from Chikurja, from the same place, Chele in Kurdish, um, the place is like whole, okay? The population is approximately 6,000 people, but the number of Turkish security forces is three times more than the number of civilians living there. And uh, in Turkish, Çukur means kind of hall, okay? And the actually geography is typically like that. It makes sense when you go there because uh, there is only one entrance and then one exit. So that everything is under constant surveillance. And at the top of every, because we are talking about the very mountainous area, which is far from, uh, you know, center, let's say, uh, center of, like, whatever, Turkey. <laughs> um, very mountainous area, remote uh, village, right beside Turkish-Iraqi borders. And at the top of every hill, uh, you can see uh, trenches. Some of them are abandoned. Uh, but they only, they are only used in case of need. So they are not completely abundant. Uh, and in most ca of the cases, they are used by village guards. Uh, the exact number of village guards from Shukurja was not known, but some people mentioned that it's more than 200 people. And uh, they didn't talk to me much, or they didn't prefer to uh, share their story with me. Um, and uh, most of the stories were like, when I was a village guard in the 90s, after that I resigned. Most of the stories are like that. Uh, so uh, you can tell that many people were forced to serve for the army. If not, they were forced to uh, vacate, actually, their uh, hometown. Uh, that was very common, uh, one of the common themes, actually. Uh, 
Um, so uh, as you can see from this slide that at the, the top of this hill, you see a military bases. Um, and I, at the top of every hill, there was one. As I said, if not a complete basis, there was a trench. If not, there were a couple people or some checkpoints along the road, right? Um, so, yeah, this is one of them. Um, first homeland, the interesting story here is, as I said, just in a nutshell, these uh, houses, they belong to people in the past. But uh, some of them are not used anymore. But uh, now the army uses them, actually. Uh, as I said, it's quite easy to turn uh, even the center of uh, villages into uh, military trenches, right? Uh, so, so the first mechanism, as I said, state wants to establish its sovereignty. It's a known story. It's a nation state, yes. Uh, if you go back to the Iberian definition of control, yes, it's there. Um, nothing is surprising, um, but the surprising part is the rest of it, right? What do they do to establish and also maintain the sovereignty? That is the question. What do I mean by intensity? Everything cannot be called intense or excessive, right? We will see uh, lots of implications of that. Uh, so in one of the interviews, let me just give you a background of the story. Uh, and then I will read the interview. I will read this quotation. In the summer of 2014, I traveled from one town to another in the vicinity of the Turkish-Iraqi borderlands. On our way to a large plateau, which is 15 minutes from the Chikurja center, the center of Cele, we saw an old man, old Kurdish man, dressed in traditional clothing. We stopped the car and walked towards his land. He was in the middle of nowhere, actually. Probably there were only soldiers and him, and uh, we could travel in the area uh, because the ban was lifted a couple of years ago, and also because of the ongoing uh, negotiations between the PKK and the state. Uh, there were some, uh, some uh, let's say, um, positive change. Uh, that's what some people told me, that at least now some lands are accessible after 15 years. That was one of the narratives I heard. But we stopped the car, we saw him on his land. Uncle Tahsin, uh, of course the name is not real, I have to keep it anonymous. Um, Uncle Tahsin was cleaning his piece of land and making tea for himself. He greeted us warmly as soon as I greeted him in Kurdish. Well, it's my mother tongue, but I was born and raised in Istanbul in a middle class uh, neighborhood. So uh, my Turkish is now much better than my Kurdish, but it's there, right? So I was speaking Kurdish when I was a kid. So we sat on his land under a large tree surrounded by steep hills, each with a military base on the top. One of the biggest bases was built right across his land. He was telling me that he used to have a lot of fruit trees. I could still see the remnants of burned trees. He walked me around the property and showed me all these trees. As we stood chatting in front of a burnt tree, he suddenly turned to me and started to speak without hiding his temper. Take a picture of everything gone. They, referring to the Turkish army and state, they sometimes use it interchangeably. Um, they didn't pay the price for any of those crimes. He then explained that he walks to his land every single day, especially in the summer, even if it takes 45 minutes by foot. Uncle Tassin insisted, insisted uh, to make us tea on his land. Um, his narrative was quite intense because his town which is also known as Seresevi in Kurdish, has been destroyed more than once. And he had experienced serious violence and harassment, in addition to losing property and land. So this is what he says in that interview, when he was making tea on his own land and greeting us in Kurdish and sharing his story. Uh, of course, I cannot uh, write everything here in this uh, short 
uh, like in this period of time. But um, as I said, uh, he also experienced harassment. He told me more stories because it was a very long interview for almost two hours. Our access to land was prohibited until the state lifted the ban in 2001. They burned our town three, four times. In Hakkari, we plant grass seeds. They grow. When they sow it, they burned it. We also had hundreds of poplar trees. They burned them all. Not even one left behind. After we had to leave the town, the police station or military base, sometimes, as I said, people also use them interchangeably, moved to the top of a hill. That was, I think, very, um, that was one of the peak moments for me in the interview. Um, because uh, you can also tell that from his reactions and from the change uh, in the tone of his voice. They took the bricks of my house and built a military site. They didn't leave any brick behind, burned all trees and houses to the ground. Now, whenever I come to my land, I see the stones of my house in the wall of the Kalekol every day. So what's Kalekol? Kalekol is this high-tech, castle-like uh, military bases that was established uh, in late 2000s. And the number of them is more than 250 now, uh, as far as I know, um, based on some data I have. So he sees uh, the stones of his house in the walls of the Kalekol every day. And yeah, this is just a picture from one of the towns where you can see abandoned house. Of course, this is also a border town from the same region. Um, and when I say Kalekol, now this is Kalekol actually. This is from Turkish-Iranian borders. Um, but you can see it's, there's a towel. Sometimes there is only one person, but because it's a high-tech building, it's quite easy to monitor every moment. OK? And. If, and because of this new design, uh, they can expand their control over territory. Uh, so the second mechanisms, the second mechanism actually, as I said, it was securitization. And this uh, leads to militarization and violence on the, on the part of people. So <coughs> militarization was actually, I had so much data on this because uh, I realized that uh, Militarization included many different techniques and strategies, okay? In some cases, we can, we can say that uh, there were many explosive debris left on the ground, and this debris of war on the ground, like unexploded shells, grenades, bombs, and landmines, was one form of militarization. Building military roads was another one, um, because majority of roads um, connecting towns and villages were pathways. However, the army built military roads for themselves. In one of the interviews, um, actually because I also talked with politicians, mayors, uh, human rights activists, and lawyers, um, one of the participants, he was a mayor, he said this, all the sealed roads are military roads. There is no sealed road made for the Kurds. They are built for police officers and also soldiers. So soldiers build roads with around seven meters wide. And there are regular military controls at checkpoints and military bases in the hills surrounding villages and surveillance via thermal cameras. Such tools actually mark out the landscape in this contested and controlled borderlands. That's what he said. And following that, actually, he continued, in the same interview, he continued. This person was, of course, prisoned in, in, in prison, arrested in the past. Uh, he had a long history of like, politics. He was like, quite experienced uh, in politics. So he says this. But of course, uh, because I use also triangulation technique, uh, I was always trying to cross-check. Um, so I don't use every interview in my uh, presentation. Uh, even if I conduct more than 115 interviews, I prefer not to use some of them. I just chose the richest ones and most relevant ones and most reliable ones, right? So here, the state has imprints in many places in Kurdistan. They declare certain areas as military prohibited zones 
or closed military zones every year. This is an entirely military mechanism, which was common in the 90s. The Office of Commander-in-Chief releases the list of military prohibited areas in their website. The soldiers turn the roofs of houses into a military front line in order to hunt guerrillas when they ambush the military bases. Imagine that the soldiers were based in one of the villagers' villagers house and will shoot guerrillas from there. That was striking to me because um, I realized that the entire town or entire village uh, became a borderland. Um, and this place was not right beside uh, the borders. In some towns, you can see border stone demarcating the border, right? Uh, you are that close to the border. Even people use, are using phones. A phone, they have secondary um, phone line from Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, but this was not right beside the border. So the entire area was turned into that kind of contested area in those days. As I said, uh, militarization included a number of techniques, and there were lots of uh, unexploded shells or ex some exploded shells, the remnants of debris on the ground. So people are just passing by these ones uh, in certain places, especially in the summer when they go to the plateau uh, to feed their animals. Right? That was summer, and it was snowing. Um, and uh, as I said, this is another picture uh, that sh that's from the closed uh, military zone, which is also known as a guerrilla-controlled area. In order to enter the area, you have to get permission from guerrillas, and they give you an ID. Um, and uh, they also accompany you uh, during your trip. So uh, this is like zero-level border uh, town which was completely demolished in the 90s uh, in the fight between both sides. Um, so, And the final one, as I said, uh, maybe we can talk more about this during the Q&A, um, but uh, it's the control of movement across borders, uh, which leads to minority fragmentation or fragmentation of the space for, uh, for minority practices and living, right? So in one of the interviews, actually, um, uh, the person who is like middle-aged man um, and of course, I have a number of interviews with women as well. And it was important to have this gender balance. Uh, sometimes language can be a barrier. Sometimes accessibility is another issue or your positionality. But women are were quite willing to communicate with me, especially uh, um, peace mothers, um, like, um, yeah, or um, people uh, who lost uh, their uh, children uh, in this war, uh, mothers of guerrillas uh, or, m martyr or martyrs. So um, in that interview, um, that's what he said to me. Illegal border crossings are seen as the violation of state sovereignty, but they are integral to our ordinary lives here. And the same person, uh, not the same person, another one, uh, but uh, they're not, uh, they are from uh, different villages, but very, they are living in the same area. He says this, my mother is from Barbari in Iraq. We are their nieces. So we are relatives. Sometimes they belong to the same tribe, okay? Ashiret, uh, because Ashiret are still quite influential in their life, including politics. Uh, so I had to bring my mother to the other side. My aunt was about to die. They didn't let us cross the border. I had to bring my mother by a cart. Just think about that. Most of the roads we use are heavily mined with ordinances. We had to open new roads for ourselves. So, nevertheless, like border crossings were dependent on contingent factors. Most of the authority of local state officials and soldiers. In the words of another participant, we see this. If the district governor and soldiers let you go, you could cross the border and bring some stuff from the other side. But if someone reports you or you step on the landmine, then there is no future for you. There were lots of amputated bodies uh, that I saw uh, 
in some of these border zones. We can talk about that. Uh, in some cases, actually, uh, animals die, like horses uh, explode, actually burn. Like, yeah. So these cluster of uh, these cluster of narratives on border control reveals the persistence use of persistent use of territorial control as a mechanism for the state to exert its power over people and land. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk today, here we see that borders serve as a terrain of contestation and compromise between state sovereignty and actors through their link to land and property. To conclude, these are the main takeaways from today's talk. I came up with a typology of territorial control in this study. Uh, and I also uh, made a handout. Um, if you want to just uh, go over that or skim through that, some of them are here, actually. Uh, you can see the theoretical, like some of the under, like theoretical underpinnings of my approach and the uh, map of um, these Kurdish borderlands in contested areas. So the second takeaway is that the excessive use, intensive use of territorial control has profound impact on the relationship between state and Kurds in Turkey. The reform process was indeed a top-down project, and the study of these contested borderlands indicate that the top-down projects are more likely to fail. Thank you very much for your patience.